Welcome everybody here to the distinguished lecture today on megawatts from buildings. Uh, the distinguished speaker of the day is Eng Lok Lee. Uh, I had the pleasure to get to know him about 15 years ago when I started working with uh, Rocky Mountain Institute and Emery Lovins. Uh, every time I would visit Emery, he would tell me, have you so far met Eng Lok Lee as the most innovative uh, engineer to reduce energy consumption in the record-breaking way, uh, even in very difficult climates of Singapore uh, and Malaysia and, and hot, humid climates uh, for commercial buildings uh, and also for uh, disk drive factories and for clean rooms. Uh, and I had the pleasure of uh, going to Singapore, meeting with him, thanks to the introductions uh, from Emery, uh, back in mid-90s. And we have been in touch since that time. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to welcome Eng Lok and request him to start his speech. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for being present. I'd like to thank the organizing committee at LBL for inviting me. So add to the frequent flyer miles, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, I've been in the business, some people might call it a racket, for <laughs> too many years. <laughs> and I've had the opportunity of working with people from the labs, uh, people like uh, Emery Levin, as, and uh, I think one of the best observations I have made over the years is uh, coefficient of reflections here have increased over the years. <laughs> it's time for change. I don't know where I heard that before. <laughs> About 20, I don't know, 25, 26 years ago, I used to work for a government agency, and uh, this is the headquarters building. Chairman had some ideas about uh, doing robotics and all kinds of interesting things, and we picked the easy one. Turns out to be the wrong decision. I thought uh, <laughs> making things efficient would be a no-brainer. So we got some money from the chairman, and we started measuring this building. And uh, what I want to point out, there's a chiller plant at the bottom. Sorry. And uh, there are pipes outside the building, which are still there to this day. We bought some magnetic flow meters, stuck them on and uh, do the basic things. We have 480-ton screw machines and 120-ton piston machines. So you have the same flow meter on the riser to the cooling tower upstairs. You measure the flow rate on the 480-ton, and then you measure the 120-ton. They are exactly the same. <laughs> and I believe uh, Emery stole this later for factor four. Actually, I'm kidding, but... Uh... <laughs> And what was curious was uh, the engineers are not really interested. So it's four times different uh, uh, tonnage, and uh, the flow is the same. So life goes on. <laughs> and uh, I learned another important uh, lesson. We called bits later on. Change out the old machines because they were making noise, and the auditorium inside was uh, bad. We moved the plant outside. And when it comes to writing engineering specs, I discovered that government agencies are more interested in uh, maintaining the appearance of impartiality than in getting savings. So I was uh, not allowed to write state-of-the-art specs because it would not be fair. <laughs> so we had little interesting discussions like, who pays my salary? <laughs> I'm supposed to work on behalf of the company, right? Not on behalf of all the vendors who might or might not want to bid on this. And this uh, issue remains today. It's one of the big, uh, as, as I see it, obstacles in government agencies to getting improvements. You must write specs in such a way that anybody who is deaf, dumb, blind, and stupid can also bid <laughs> and be given a fair chance. Uh, coming background where space cooling is a big part of the commercial building uh, energy usage, uh, typically 60%. Uh, I tend to focus on the big stuff, 80-20 yeah? uh, as you call it. 
There are other issues in Asia where people will take your specs and your documents and give it to their brothers-in-law to install stuff. So <laughs> makes it difficult. No? So early on, uh, I learned uh, it's best to look at systems in a systems kind of way. Um, I work for a company called Train. You might have heard of this uh, little company. We sell chillers. <laughs> I'm obliged to say, please buy Train. OK, that's it. <laughs> if you look at the system for uh, air conditioning or process cooling, you start on the left. You have an air loop, which is typically air handlers, which I can hear here, or fan coil units. You use air as a medium of uh, transport to move uh, clean air, to remove humidity, to remove temperature rise. You do it through a heat exchanger, which is typically a coil with uh, water. To move the air, you need uh, kilowatts in the fan, although there are passive systems that don't use this. You transfer the heat to a loop of water, typically. And uh, the pump needs kilowatts. You stuff that into a chiller, which has its own refrigerant loop, which also needs a kilowatt to drive the compressor. You dump that to a condensing unit, which also has water in it, typically for big plants. Again, we need the kilowatt. And then finally, you throw all this hot, humid air out to your neighbors. Uh, hopefully not. And the fans, again, need kilowatts. So it's very useful to think of a system kilowatt per ton for HVAC, which is a sum of all the kilowatts divided by the tons that you have managed to remove from the first loop. Anybody want to give a shot at what's the best kilowatt per ton for air conditioning applications in the tropics? Your reflection coefficient exceeds that for this competition. <laughs> um, 1985.7, AT&T factory in Singapore making phones. 0 0.7 kilowatt, which is a sum of all kilowatts. And presently, as train, we are offering on the water side. Water side means from here to the end. No air side. Water side at 0.6 typically, although we've offered 0.58. You might be familiar with this from ASHRAE. This is a little bit loaded because it has seasonal temperature changes. But we would say 0.6 is OK, pretty good. 0.55 might be the current state of the art for comfort applications. And uh, many audits in Singapore, which are sponsored by the government, I believe they have 140 audits now, uh, show worse than 1.2. So there's a no-brainer method to get half the savings in HVAC. But you would not believe how difficult it is to get people to specify 0.6, because you're not fair. <laughs> My brother-in-law is also an air conditioning contractor, and he, he can't do it, therefore. <laughs> So taking the five circle diagram and uh, following from left to right, no? let's start at the air side. What are the typical issues? This is a built up air handler for some public institution I'm not allowed to mention. No? In Singapore, there are severe laws. <laughs> uh, you will hear sayings like uh, uh, built up air handlers are more efficient, you know? more flexibility for the engineers to do what is needed? So this is an auto roll uh, filter. It's kind of like big toilet paper roll on top, and it comes down. <laughs> and uh, there are many trade-offs in this. Low efficiency of filter, high cost. And uh, if you go beyond the coil and look at the inlet to the fan, you know all the dust goes through this toilet roll and uh, <laughs> builds up. So the aerodynamic efficiency of the fan blades is gone. This uh, dust will go into the ducting system, diffusers, and IAQ, and stuff like that. So this is a view of the fan inside, big axial fan. Uh, bad outlet flare. I think all of us know you need to do one in seven. 
there's a butterfly damper right after the fan, which is uh, taking away 20% of the pressure development of the fan. So that's not so good. These are some suggested improvements. Take away the butterfly damper, put it into normal dampers with streamline and very low pressure drop and stuff like that. Another industry, this is the uh, semiconductor industry, wafer fab in Japan. This is one of uh, five on the same site. And uh, I'm told the government ministry uh, came and said, let's uh, upgrade the fab for better efficiency. So these are stainless steel uh, silencers. Maybe you've seen it, it's very common in Japan. And on the other side of the stainless steel uh, wall of silencers, you can see the anchor points for the old axial fans, which were upgraded at government expense into these uh, mixed flow fans. So you would expect an upgrade to deliver substantially better performance. I think cost is not an issue. It's a kind of a test project. You take a picture of this with my Nikon D2X, of course. <laughs> and uh, what is interesting is, has the aerodynamic efficiency of the fan been improved? So you look at the inlet to a mixed flow fan. Uh, I'm not a fan engineer, but uh, you don't get a nice bell curve you know, from here into the fan inlet. You get this square edge just in front of the blade, and uh, man, that kills. <laughs> Plate efficiency, I don't understand this, but. And you look at the business end. The air comes out through a set of dampers and then into cooling coils. Uh, this fab is, I think, two or three million CFM of air, so that's a lot of horsepower in the fans. And then as a design build engineer, I need to look at all the details. And uh, without spending time on this, you can see that the aerodynamics on the dampers is bad. <laughs> the edges of the casing are folded inward to catch the airstream. I don't know why. But <laughs> and then you look at the outlet of a mixed flow fan, and it comes out through this annulus at very high velocity, which is uh, losing your static pressure. Don't understand. Your velocity pressure. This is bad. And high turbulence. Behind that, you have... Uh, butterfly dampers, normal butterfly, uh, parallel bladed dampers. So that's also losing pressure because your dampers are only seeing air velocity from the annulus at very high discharge uh, speed, so very high noise, and you can hear the dampers rattling. So if you select a high efficiency uh, mixed flow fan, Almost 75% peak, 76% uh, peak efficiency. How do you handle the discharge? This is the way it's done at present in this fab. And this is very high friction loss because the air doesn't see the entire cross-sectional area. It only sees the annulus. So what we need to do is to bo borrow from Pratt and Whitney on <laughs> jet engine discharge. You need to do this to get very low friction loss on the discharge because we need to look at system efficiency for the fan. And uh, if I can leave one message with you, fan systems need to look at 10,000 CFM per kilowatt. So we've uh, tried to apply this. This is for another semiconductor uh, plant in Singapore. Take out the old air handler, put in uh, much higher efficiency filters, and bring the overall CFM per kilowatt up. So in terms of uh, fan and chiller efficiency, 80% reduction. So that's slightly better than factor four. Uh, plan view, v shape the coils to increase surface area. Uh, a little bit unusual filter section layout to reduce frictional loss. Direct drive on the fan to reduce the uh, rubber losses into the airstream, which are not wanted. Cross-sectional view, so we have to do steps 
on the site because there are existing cable trays, ductwork, sprinklers, etc. cannot be moved. And a little summary. Old air handler, 340 tons. Uh, the replacement is 354. Uh, ASU efficiency in terms of kilowatt per ton because this is uh, servicing outside air at a wet bulk design of 27 degrees C. So there's a five times drop in uh, kilowatt per ton. Payback in 1.9 years, and this is in the year 2000. So uh, with today's rates, it would be less than one year. Again, air site issues. At any scale, you look at the conventional practice, it's uh, quite bad. This is the inlet to a gas turbine for uh, FAB, which does its own cogeneration. Um, designed and built by a big Japanese company, I'm told the biggest in Japan. Selection of filters, uh, casing construction, angles inside the airstream that catch the air, etc., etc. Uh, transformations that are extremely sharp, so that's another loss. You need to do something like this, huh? but uh, <laughs> there's nothing blocking it. I don't think the cost of sheet metal would bankrupt them, <laughs> or, but anyway. Uh, closer to home in Singapore. Our hawker centers are very well known, if anybody has been to Singapore. And uh, you commonly see mistakes like this. Exhaust ducting, you should come here and come up, right? 45, 45. If you do this, two streams of uh, very healthy oil, <laughs> high cholesterol oil, <laughs> will meet in the middle and condense out. That's exactly what happens. Uh, why not? Uh, I don't know. This is everywhere. And this causes a lot of horsepower and noise. New shopping mall in Singapore, near my favorite movie cinema. Every time I go here, I have to shade my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it is so common. Um, coordination means that the guy who got here, here first is usually the piping guy. Pipes are much easier to sling up at high speed. So you're left with whatever is left. <laughs> And here is a design engineer's uh, issue. You have a fan, air handler, with a fan discharging at low level, which then has to make a heroic turn, and another heroic turn with a gigantic flare here. You can specify air handlers with a discharge on top, and then you avoid all the heroics. You just have to call train, 1-800-train. <laughs> This is from the airport, and uh, everywhere you go, there are these heroic flares. You should not have symmetrical flares. Huh? The discharge should be a lot longer. Uh, right angles, right angles, etc., etc. Uh, one of our platinum-rated buildings in Singapore, you know, another heroic turn from the... <laughs> Commercial buildings. This is a very tall office uh, building, Raffle City. Um, somebody in New York, I'm not picking on New York, you know, the good guys. <laughs> Somebody designed the air handlers. Obviously, uh, system efficiency was not a consideration. So we went in and did a 50% change out. Uh, potential for savings is very high because of running hours and uh, larger uh, air volumes. This is a semiconductor plant, 90% savings on the air side. Simplicity is one of the things that we need to strive for. There's a conflict between uh, the way engineers are rewarded today and uh, how, how the reward system should actually function. Most of us are paid on a percentage of cost, install cost. So there is a, I don't know, conscious or unconscious <laughs> desire to jack up the cost. This is uh, AT&T Thailand. And, uh, the owner came to us because we did AT&T Singapore and he said, you know, Lee, we have to double deck the pumps because there are so many pumps. So what is the answer? We put all the cooling towers outside. We reselected all the equipment to have uh, equal, almost equal pressure drops, two pumps. So we have 20 something pumps down to two pumps, less space, less time, less cost, higher efficiency, etc., etc. We need to think in terms of megawatts. Usually you can do it with less. 
This is a project from China. Somebody had a clean room which uh, had uh, air handlers at the wall. And uh, Chinese, I'm not picking on Chinese companies. <laughs> the thinking is kind of linear. We will do uh, filters the way we've always done filters, right? So many square feet, one filter box. Whatever the pressure drop is, we can handle because we know where to buy fans. <laughs> And of course, uh, I knew somebody, and he brought me in, and he said, this is going to add a lot of uh, horsepower. What do we do? So I said, you can actually do this cheaper and better, because you are not constrained by rules of thumb that say so many square feet, so many air change, so many filters. Go back and rethink. We don't want this turbulent flow in an uh, injection molding area, which is making syringes. We need to have a kind of unidirectional flow. Let's construct a huge filter bank and create unidirectional flow, which will be cleaner and much less pressure drop. And let's not put in all these booster fans. The savings in ducting and booster fans pays for the extra filters, which have less spread, so on a life cycle basis, and in first cost, is cheaper and better. Another example of the megawatt thinking, this time it's from Phoenix, Arizona. So this uh, facilities guy says, Lee, you know, my consultant, which is one of the biggest in the world, has told me that my clean rooms need more cooling water. And the only way to do that is to run new pipes and pumps. And this will take months and, uh, you know, we're going to have to shut down and it's going to cost more than $100,000. So what is the deal? And uh, if you think out of the box a little bit, these dry coils are run with 16 degrees chill water, and uh, we get the 16 by going through a heat exchanger from the chiller. So uh, the automatic reaction for many of us is, it's 16 degrees, I need more flow, I know where I can buy pipes <laughs> and pumps and so on. The other way of thinking is, uh, how can I do more with less? So you go back and you ask uh, the Toyota you know, production system, the five whys, why is it 16? My girlfriend was 16 when I first, uh, okay, let me think again. <laughs> why not 15? Well, it's illegal in the US, no, okay. Why, why, not, <laughs> why not 14? Why not 13? And at some point, you get to the dew point of the space and you say condensation happens and you stop. But there's actually no magic on 16. You are not using any energy extra because you already had six degrees C. So you could get 15, 14. And uh, I told him, and he went out, and he changed the settings, and he said, I just saved 100,000 bucks. <laughs> Sticking with the fluid side. This is a fab, again, in Japan. We look at the vacuum pumps. And I want to say that almost anything that uses energy needs to be looked at with a new pair of eyes. So there's uh, hundreds of these in the basement of the fab. They use uh, cooling water. There are five fabs, so there's over 1,000 vacs on one side. 13 degrees C cooling water. Of course, the Toyota method is uh, Y13. I know it's illegal, but Y13. <laughs> Could it be 14? Could it be 15? They have constant uh, chill water flow through the pump, even when it's not working, which is most of the time. So I told the Japanese uh, fab manager, who is a very nice guy, why don't you pull out your specs in Japanese? I can't read it, but you read it, and you tell me what the spec says. And I know the spec doesn't say 13. So the spec is less than 30. And you can go to the outlet being 40. And there are no other constraints, so you can actually vary the flow through the pumps when it's not working. So we can actually go to variable temperature and variable flow. You don't need 13, which is a load on the chiller and uh, more chill water piping and plate heat exchangers. And so if we were to redo a quick estimate, it's 170 kilowatt a fab. 
five fabs. You know. And I'm uh, happy to say that this is being considered as a Japanese standard for fabs now. Uh, at one of the JITA meetings, Japan Electronic Industries Trade Association, they took this up. Uh, if you look at the 12 months of the year, this is the possible cooling water temperature you can get from certain location in Japan. And uh, they are going to work with the vacuum pump suppliers and get rid of uh, requirement for chill water. So it's kind of a no-brainer. Many, of course, it's not really a no-brainer because <laughs> there are hundreds of fabs in Japan, but potential saving could run hundreds of megawatts. <coughs> and it would be cheaper to use cooling towers rather than chillers because the cost of chillers is like, I don't know, 20 times higher than cooling towers. Sticking with the water side, huh? just before I came, I went to a big shopping mall to do something and uh, this was very interesting. Domestic water. Pumping. One normally doesn't think of this as being a big user, but the pumps, I think, were originally 100-something, 125 horse or 150 horse. And, uh, of course, they are so oversized that they have to throttle the discharge. <laughs> and uh, if you look at the piping uh, design, this is a very short radius elbow, which is it's not what you need. And on the suction side, one has the same problem. Everywhere, there are right angles. And just in case the first throttling valve was not enough, which it wasn't, they put the second one. <laughs> so we are not uh, talking rocket science. There's a lot of common sense that seems to disappear in real world. Look at the number of right angle elbows everywhere, 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 everywhere. Going back to Japan, this is all stainless steel fittings, so it's not really very cheap. <laughs> You look at the number of elbows. <clears throat> when you enter a pipe like a pump like this, you're going to have a tremendous swirl on the inlet, and I've done this mistake myself, so I can tell you, <laughs> you will lose a lot of uh, pressure development on the pumps. You should actually turn the pumps and uh, have them facing the entry at the wall, and then you have a straight shot and eliminate. But uh, my brother-in-law sells stainless steel fittings, so. This is my favorite part of any talk. <laughs> Train is a very generous company, <laughs> but not that generous. <laughs> Some of you might know this is a Bugatti Veyron, the first production sports car to hit or slightly exceed 1,000 horsepower on the engine. And the reason I bring this up, you need to get 1,000 horse to the wheels. But in order to get 1,000 horse to the wheels, uh, uh, Petrol engine is around 30% efficient. So two thirds of the energy is thrown away. So to get a thousand horse, mechanical shaft power, you need to throw away 2000 horse. That's a lot of tonnage. That's several hundred tons of cooling if you think in air conditioning terms. So roughly a third of it gets dumped in exhaust and roughly a third goes out through the radiators. To make this work, they have 11 radiators. It can run at top speed for 10 minutes and then the tires burn. But <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to point out is, in air conditioning, we also face a heat transfer problem. But our solutions are often not very elegant. All the solutions need to look like this. <laughs> So on the chiller plan, we've introduced uh, the concept of twin temperature loops. So why do we use uh, twin temperature loops? Uh, quite straightforward thermodynamic reasons. Uh, CFC project, we need extra piping because now you have two sets of uh, temperatures to handle. But the very large uh, gain is uh, you can get the chiller at below 0.4 kilowatt per ton in case any of you are in the business, and you can get the plant to 0.48, which I believe was a world record at the time it was installed in 94 or 95. And of course, now you can get chiller plant. Uh, train is routinely offering better than 0.6 in tropical conditions. So if you take a typical fab with 10,000 ton average load, 
There are sites with 250,000 tons, so 10,000 is not a large site. At 15 cents, sorry. Going from a normal 0.7 to 0.48 will save 2.9, so the payback is typically in the order of one year or less. Because you have now downsized your electrical requirements, which are quite extensive. And of course, your high temperature machine is, uh, at the time we installed it, was 30% cheaper for the same tonnage. And this is the site that it was installed at. And they track the kilowatt hour usage. Some poor fellow has to go and write it down <laughs> on a log sheet every day. And they've been going for decades before this even. They benchmark against uh, production of wafers, and you will see from 3,500 wafers to 5,200 wafers, some of which is uh, productivity gains. Uh, plant room has got tremendous uh, savings, so this is not rocket science. In doing all of this, there's a philosophy thing which I think uh, the market still does not accept. It is assumed that if you don't have uh, accurate instruments, you can uh, achieve all these numbers, like 0.6, like 0.48. And uh, my experience is you cannot. That's why in the world, there are hardly any credible claims of high efficiency, because the measurement equipment is not good enough. So simple example. Take an existing plant at one kilowatt per ton, you retrofit it at one at 0.7, you save 0.3, it's 30%, let's say that's $100,000 a year. If you follow ARI 550, which is the test, test standard for rating standard for chillers, 5% error is allowed. And that could lead you to $22,000 error. And in the field, I don't think anybody gets 10% even. You can be 40 something thousand dollars out. That's why many shared savings contracts have gone astray, and uh, many owners will not accept shared savings contract. Uh, we've tested, uh, you would think the semiconductor boys are more interested in accuracy because of ISO 9000 and all kinds of requirements for environmental conditions, and yet here's a new fab, chill water supply is used as control uh, methodology. This is their building automation, which is New, and this is our audit, which is triple probe, three probes in one sensor, and they are out by 1.4 degree. And you follow the logic, and they are wasting 320,000 Singapore dollars a year, which is $200,000 a year on one probe. And people talk to me about, hey, how come your probe costs $500 more? How do you justify it? Uh, like this? Here's also another building automation system from uh, International School in Singapore from 1999. This is the manufacturer's claim, happens to be trained, kilowatt per ton, tons, standard layout. Building automation shows 0.4 kilowatt per ton, which is <laughs> impossible. Until today, train doesn't make a 0.4 at comfort conditions, ARI comfort. So this is one of the issues. If your instrumentation is wrong, are you confident that you're going to take any measures to rectify it? The readings are saying you're good. In fact, you're better than good. In fact, you're at impossible. <laughs> so what <laughs> improvements are possible? None. Uh, another uh, argument we frequently hear is uh, you don't need to sample so fast and you don't need to store it. All witness evidence and historic uh, medical records shall be destroyed after <laughs> The patient leaves the hospital, or something like that. If you scan at five minutes, and this is from a York chiller, train chillers would never do it. <laughs> you notice uh, there are three, uh, two machines, one machine here, and this chill water on one machine, and you think something looks not quite right. But at five minutes, you can't tell. And we go to one second, and uh, something is wrong with the PID tuning on this York. And this was uh, installed at the same time as a total of five machines, and the, the other machine is fine. So sampling period makes a lot of difference. We had to call in York to retune the PID controller. So uh, Train Singapore uh, has invested a lot in uh, instrumentation. We go back to triple point cells, gallium cells, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to make sure that uh, the results delivered are credible. You hear the comment, we use industrial-grade sensors. 
And somebody in our office said, to me, industrial grade means it looks ugly. <laughs> you can go to the internet, you can download this. Typical building automation sensor specs, things like 0.34 degrees Fahrenheit, etc., etc. What we need to maintain ARI 550 is 0 0.03 degrees C. And we are prepared to take a performance contract for 10 years. So the electronics and the sensors have to be <laughs> reliable for 10 years. Yamatake is a very well known vendor, at least in Singapore, for industrial systems and uh, 0.15 degrees C. So at start, this is five times worse than what we need for ARI 550. So, so here's an example of the Negawatt thinking. New fab was set up. We've done work for this uh, client, new machines, a bunch of 2,000 tons. Um, you hear the word SCADA, you know, SCADA. So it's perfect, it's great, it's good. And uh, the bills were saying otherwise. The facilities guy knew us for many years, called us in, and uh, the meter is out by 23%. And everybody has signed off on the project. <laughs> In order to cut cost, you use one of these uh, annual bar, annual bar, pitot tube deals huh, with pressure drop. <clears throat> when you're running 10,000 ton of chiller plant, <laughs> I think you can afford a half percent magnetic. Hmm? So the approach is uh, quite straightforward. We just do fundamental engineering, go back, get all the curves at part loads, and you drive the salespeople uh, crazy because nobody ever asks <laughs> for printouts at different flow rates, different temperatures, uh, etc. And then you compare it to our, we set up another data acquisition on site, and uh, it is far out. It is far out from the manufacturer's claims. So how do we rectify this and boost the capacity? So one of the issues is a lot of uh, engineering is based on ideology. Let me repeat that, ideology. <laughs> People don't go by facts or measurements or ideology. So there's one ideology that says balancing valves. You know? And my mission in life, apart from keeping my coefficient <laughs> down, is Get rid of all the balancing valves. So everywhere in the world we go. So here is a 20-inch pipe. This vendor only makes 14-inch valves. So they knock it down from 20 to 14, which is a tremendous. Uh, so it's six months old. We take it and put it on the floor and put a bypass section. <laughs> which increases the flow rate, this is the flow rate this time, from here to here. And we are getting tremendous increase in flow rate for a very slight increase in pump uh, kilowatt. Won't bore you with the details, but we can uh, remove with this and that 350 kilowatt just by tuning. This is a bunch of secondary pumps we took out from another project. <laughs> And finally, on the fifth loop of the HVAC system is cooling towers. We need to dump the heat we've collected in the building, but we need to give the uh, cooling towers room to breathe. They need a very uh, large amount of free area for air to go in and then get discharged. You put it like this, and this fellow will come back here, and this guy will come back here. It's good to see old friends, but not when they are hot and wet. <laughs> there is enough space. And this is just next to the train office in Singapore. Big company just set this up. There's enough space to pull this to that side, but I don't know. Standing at my front door is a Japanese, I shall not mention the name, company. <laughs> and you can watch. They also put the cooling towers next to each other which is going to kill the condenser water temperature. And this is common. I've seen it throughout the world. I think I can fairly say throughout the world. People will come up with absurd statements on the wet bulb. They are taking readings from very poor designs, and uh, that becomes uh, <laughs> information that the next generation of engineers will mis-select, uh, mis-design for. 
um, Google Earth, University. Look at the number of towers stuck closely together. This is the Faculty of Engineering. <laughs> How to sell more chillers, <laughs> I don't know. You go down, here are the cooling towers, you look at these little portholes. I went here and uh, you cannot even get your fingers into the louvers. It's like another part of the university, same problem. Award-winning hospital, look at this. And uh, we have been there because these are train chillers and uh, ridiculous temperatures. There's enough rooftop that they could have spread this out, but anyway. <coughs> but it's not a uniquely Singapore problem. Uh, this is Japan. You look at this and you say, this is a bad selection. The efficiency of the cooling towers in terms of kilowatt per ton, you would never use it. Unless you are shareholders in a power station, you know, coal fire. <laughs> You go between the cooling towers, my goodness, there's no space. So the selection of the tower is wrong in energy terms. The spacing is wrong. Tell you a little story about cooling towers. First time I went to Houston, and uh, I look at these cooling towers, and I said to the engineer, Michael, I said, Mike, you know, these uh, towers don't work. I have it on reliable information that they don't work. They run very hot. And he said, Lee, you are right. My train... Train, train Houston, you know, train chillers. We have uh, gauges, and the gauge on the outlet reads zero to 100 degrees F. And uh, you're right, in summer it runs so hot that the gauges go out of range, you cannot. And I said, so how do you solve the tower problem? He said, I, I changed the gauges, you know. Now I, <laughs> now I have 120 degrees, you know, I fixed that, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Singapore, new district cooling plan. Cooling towers, Google Earth. Take my Nikon D700 <laughs> and you go to the building uh, across and you see, my goodness, the towers are squeezed together. How will the air flow? So I made a little inquiry to one of our sales guys and he said, how did you know? They just ordered the new chillers with 32 degrees C inlet water because the old <laughs> chillers were selected for 30 and they cannot handle it because the towers are not working. So now the new chillers are much worse efficiency. <laughs> there are so many train wrecks in slow motion. But it's also in industry. We did some work with Amory Levins. This is a LNG plant. These are the heat rejection, which are fin fan coolers. Uh, Amory says this is the size of a battleship, if you want to get an idea of scale. It's very tall, it's elevated, but when the wind blows in summer, northern uh, hemisphere summer, when the price of LNG is highest, the output of the plant is the lowest. <laughs> because the hot air blows in and the outlet of this gets into the inlet of this and the outlet of this goes into the inlet of this and the production of LNG drops like crazy. You basically have to take uh, methane and cool it to minus 173 or something. So heat rejection is a common problem and uh, common stuff like uh, nowhere for the heat to go, nobody <laughs> looks at that. But there's also good news. Italy, some, some, be, some people used to run all the, the plants in winter. So we say, hey, it's a simple way, get heat exchangers, use inverters, set up your controls, you can get free cooling. This is kind of a no-brainer, and uh, free cooling for more than 100 days a year is four megawatts of saving. Somewhat related to getting rid of heat, uh, Kogen, three numbers of Kawasaki, uh, no, Mitsu, uh, IHI, Ishikawa, Jima, Harima, Heavy Industry, 6.3 megawatt, total 18 megawatt plant. Uh, chimney for the hot air, hot exhaust. They go in at right angles. I do not understand it. And, you know, back pressure on turbines is bad for efficiency and bad for rated output. Very simple. Do this. 
Look at the other side. I don't know why they must have this big... Uh, I don't know what the reward system is like for... <laughs> if the reward system had been uh, rated on... You must guarantee you know, X percent efficiency for total system. I think we would have different uh, results than this. Quick one, uh, my last uh, example. 1.4 million square feet uh, retrofit. Post office headquarters of Singapore, Google Earth. Cooling towers here and here, not so ideal, but okay, we live with that. Audits with sensors, thermistors, kilowatt, etc., etc., weather stations. The facilities manager's audit, which shows even six kilowatt per ton on a central chill water plant, but hey. And this is from a public domain. You can go and search in Singapore websites and you can see this is from one of the universities, different location, different kilowatt per ton. Not so good. No? And this is our audit uh, report, which we give to the client. This is something I would encourage if you are writing specs. If you are paying for the data, you deserve to get uh, the raw data. And in Singapore, everybody hides the data just in case there are bodies <laughs> to be found. <laughs> this is our uh, psychrometric chart. You will notice Singapore has a very tight uh, cluster for the whole year. It's always hot and humid. Uh, all the component averages, in this case, uh, cooling tons, etc., etc. Uh, kilowatt per ton for condenser water pumps. Uh, of course, there's a lot more, but uh, running out of time. Train. Now, all spell after me. T -R <laughs> we supplied machines at 0.49. We guaranteed 0.603 for the system for initial period of two years with optional renewal for eight years. Oh. So we are prepared to go 10 years at 0.6. And this is not new because the Hyatt Hotel in Singapore is now eight years old. Existing layout, uh, headquarters building, lots of money. They were not short of money. But uh, if you look at the layout, it's not so nice. Huh? It doesn't look like a Bugatti Veyron with a thousand horsepower. <laughs> a lot of uh, elbows, twist turns. You cannot measure the flow rate into the machine because there's not enough pipe length huh, to, to do that. So this is making the sausage. And uh, here we are trying to make the pipe length as smooth as possible to get our magnetic flow meter with uh, you know, 5 plus 2 diameters. And this is all the old stuff you can see. Mm -hmm. Tremendous U-turns. So straighten out. In uh, real world retrofits, we don't have the time, the space, the ability to shut down to what, do what we like. There's a 28-inch uh, header overhead. We cannot move it. It would cost hundreds of thousands to move it so that we could get good uh, flow conditions. So this flow meter is not in a good place, but hey, that's all we can do. I mentioned before, mission in life is to get rid of uh, control valves and primary secondary pumping. So we are down to uh, primary pumping, so we do a bypass, this is a quick way. So there are a lot of pumps here for sale in case anybody needs <laughs> pumps, you know. And uh, this, this motto, I'm told, was new. They just bought it because the old one burned out, 20,000 Singapore dollars. Then we came in and took it out. <laughs> These are 175 horse and we put in 40 horse. Quick summary, uh, if you see two kilowatt per ton, even under tropical conditions, that's bad for a chiller plant. Average in Singapore, 1 to 1.2. If you can go to 0.9, that was a year before, energy smart rating, now it's 0.75. If you can do 0.7, we would say that's good practice. And this is defined as an average each quarter. 0.6 would be excellent, and uh, if anybody wants to shell out the money, we'll sign on the dotted line for 0.55. Plant life is quite long, but many people are still putting in very poor efficiency plants. Prices are going up, uh, global warming, etc., etc. And as we say, you can't cross a stream with two jumps. You know, one jump and you're across. You know, or 
So how do we know we are getting these uh, actual results? So we do a live heat balance. I don't think anybody else <laughs> does this. And our live heat balance is able to produce 5%. Uh, the software on the site allows you to do this uh, system uh, input, system output, and you can have before, after. And very simple uh, aggregation. For each day, you can get total kilowatt hours, total ton hours, and total kilowatt per ton. And for this week, we are at 0.5673. Some weeks, we are at 0.55. Instantaneously, we can be at 0.5152, but anyway. Another way to represent performance, which is uh, kilowatt per ton against tons. So we are always at 0.5 something. You've got to be here when new, because in eight years, who knows? <laughs> is this new? This is not new. The Grand Hyatt Singapore was uh, also guaranteed at 0.58. That's eight years ago. This is a big plant, uh, 22 something, 23,000 tons. 0.875. I had this interesting discussion with some uh, gentleman from the ministry <clears throat> who says, we are encouraging the use of district cooling plants because it's more efficient, you know, economies of scale. And I said, no, <laughs> all the district cooling plants are very bad. <laughs> not in the Michael Jackson sense, you know. Bad is not good, I mean, it's just bad is bad. <laughs> <laughs> we are able to do local plants at better than 0.6. And uh, it's quite strange that in Singapore, I've been told by government officials, none of the district cooling operators want to reveal their kilowatt per ton <laughs> because they are all worse than 0.9 or 1. So what are the practical suggestions to address this? You've all heard of the Ansari X Prize, right? This is rocket science. And uh, for the Negawatt, I would call them the Negawatt X Prizes. The first high temperature chiller plant, in other words, run at 12 degrees, 13 degrees, 15 degrees, system at 0.4. The low temperature plant at 0.5. We're already doing 0.58, so this is not a big stretch. Uh, MNV is very important because a uh, lot of issues in this area. If you can achieve ARI 550 accuracy, that means uh, tons and kilowatt per ton at 5% tolerance for a period of five years or 10 years, give them money. Uh, lighting systems to achieve consistently for the long term 200 lumens a watt. And for comfort application, 0.65. Uh, sorry, yeah, which includes the air side, which I believe has not been done yet. And uh, on a larger scale, to get property developers to get recognition for sharing information. Right now, there are a lot of dead bodies, uh, you know. <laughs> everywhere, and nobody dares to let the bodies. And this is a good thing about medical science, you know. You can give your name to a disease. <laughs> I'm not suggesting you give names, but. <laughs> Partly, medical science has improved tremendously because people donate dead bodies, and I'm sure there are a lot of dead buildings out there. <laughs> Something encouraging. The Ministry of Environment in Singapore in August 2007, came out with this in the newspapers, uh, better ways to desalinate seawater, and uh, they actually had a specific number instead of hand-waving. Most of these green buildings and lead is hand-waving. Uh, total energy consumption of not more than 1.5 kilowatt hour per cubic meter of water produced, which is less than half the energy used by other technologies. Very specific. And uh, last year, Middle of last year, there was a big water conference and Siemens got a four million Singapore dollar award because they are using some electronic method to get desalination. Disruptive technology. This is what we are looking for in buildings and fabs. And I'll close with this. There is no off-the-shelf delivery process to, in place to develop truly effective energy efficiency improvements with long-term performance assurance. And I can tell you that uh, we have audited uh, award-winning buildings, and <laughs> you know what to expect, right? Nobody's measuring, so what, do you, what did you think? 
Many people would sooner die than think. In fact, they do. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, any questions? Questions? Very inspiring presentation. At one place, you mentioned that the payback would be within less than one year. My impression was that with all that downsizing, the initial cost would be lower than the alternative cost. So the payback is is instantaneous. Yeah. Is that exactly what you uh, repeat? Or uh, you would say it differently? I'm still employed by train, so I <laughs> should be very careful. <laughs> I would say in many cases, you can uh, do efficiency at negative cost. But there are many reasons why you don't push <laughs> for negative cost. Okay, thank you. Yes, I have a quick question. I actually have two questions. The first is, in your studies, what have you found to be the optimum leaving chilled water temperature for a comfort cooling application? So that's my first question. The second question is, how did you, or how are you getting the design community in Singapore to specify KW per ton for a plant, and how are you getting the design community to con contracting community to actually implement that? Um, I think on your first question, there is actually no real optimum. Depends on the size, the distances you have to pump, uh, requirements of the client. Probably you would use a higher temperature than normal and uh, combine that with air site uh, treatment. For example, train. <laughs> train. Train sells a product called CDQ that can dehumidify below chilled water dew point. So the best approach in energy terms would be to combine the water and the air. The second question, um, clients are starting to ask for kilowatt per ton. Right now, our telecommunications authority has got several bits out that say 0.6 or better. They have had endless complaints from everybody. <laughs> Most of the other vendors say we can't do it. Or if I need to do it, I'll jack up my price by you know, many percent because I don't know how it can be done. And uh, the vendor who is selling me the machines is also not confident that it can be done. So I think the owner needs to drive this, not, not the consultants. And, uh, <laughs> this has to do with the whole business model of, of megawatt type businesses. Essentially, what the pitch is to a, a property manager is that the energy savings will be based on uh, the differential between it, what it would have been if they do nothing and what they're going to do if they sign the contract. So without baseline data, which usually is not available, right. how, how do you bridge that gap? Do you have any suggestions for that? Uh, I think in some countries, uh, I can say for Singapore, the government is uh, willing to give you uh, audit grants that amount to 50% of the cost of audits. But having said that, a lot of the studies are wrong. Do you, I, I'm curious about uh, the evolution of the control industry and their ability to host the continuous monitoring systems and whether you see improvements uh, compared to the third party monitoring that, that you typically have to do. Mm. I must say that uh, Johnson Controls is active as an ESCO. They are probably, they claim, the world's uh, largest. But in projects that we have been head-to-head uh, -head with them, we don't see that they are putting in continuous monitoring. And the other thing we are always concerned is uh, how accurate is the system being delivered? Can you prove that you are meeting ARI 550? And uh, typically they can't, but the salespeople will wave hands. And <laughs> so, so you use uh, industrial measurement standards as the no, reference? No, 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 please. Ugly, no. <laughs> the ugly ones. 
I would have to say you need to meet ARI 550 for the reason that you're buying machines at 550 and you would like to verify that what you bought sometimes at great cost right. is performing at the manufacturer's curves. Right, and 550 is, is typically not continuous measurements. Those are usually lab tests. Um, I think the concept we get come away with from 550 is that you have to guarantee the performance, which is uh, tonnage and uh, kilowatt per ton. And we like to maintain these two, but continuously. Also, at off design conditions, you can typically get printouts from the suppliers at different you know, flow rates. And so we'd like to see that the machines are actually meeting these uh, off design conditions, which is most of the time. And I think I'm correct when I say nobody offers that yet as a standard product. So that should be part of the X prize. A follow-up question to uh, Marianne. You were a leader in uh, dashboards with electric value. In fact, there were some slides there. Um, where do you see that now in terms of uh, dashboards availability and sophistication? To be rude, I would say that sex sells. <laughs> Too much attention is put on interfaces, and not enough is paid on the basic engineering and instrumentation. So uh, garbage in, garbage out. You get the wrong data, you display it nicely. It's still wrong. I think a lot of the work needs to go into getting this ARI 550 first before we sex it up. <laughs> um, you look at the layouts that they have for um, uh, the piping and the systems. You think, what, what were they thinking when they designed that? And I think you've hit the nail on the head. They, people weren't thinking. Design engineers, piping engineers weren't thinking. It's easy to lay out things on, on right angles. Uh, you talked about the role of, of clients in specifying energy efficiency. What, what's your thoughts on the role of regulation and the role of the institutions which are training uh, engineers to help people think, help engineers think energy efficiency when they're designing? The theory is always good. No child left behind. <laughs> <laughs> no client left behind, but uh, yes, lots of uh, education, and uh, I, at least from Singapore, I think some of the government uh, regulators are strong believers in regulation, because, uh, for example, in buildings, a lot of buildings get sold, and uh, you know they say there are three important things in buildings: location, location, location. Everything else is irrelevant in terms of making money, which is like... <laughs> so, even with the incentives, you still see very bad, uh, badly designed, build, badly maintained buildings going up. So they are going to try the stick approach. <laughs> Small carrot, big stick. <laughs> we have time for one last question. is about large systems. Uh, what are your thoughts on doing the equivalent for residential or smaller level systems? Do you think the payback might be reasonable or is it much more extended? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, we don't work in those areas, but I think uh, LBL and other people, including our government, have uh, gone into things like labeling, you know, high COP products. Uh, I guess that's a reasonable way to do it. That I would like to bring the meeting to a formal close. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.